United Nations headquarters in New York, United States President Eisenhower arrives to make a proposal for the constructive use of atomic power. Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld greets the president. Inside the impressive hall, Madam Pandit, president of the General Assembly, welcomes Eisenhower. Fellow delegates, it gives me great pleasure to present to you the President of the United States of America. Madam President, members of the General Assembly, I know that the American people share my deep belief that if a danger exists in the world, it is a danger shared by all. And equally, that if hope exists in the mind of one nation, that hope should be shared by all. If there is to be advanced any proposal designed to ease, even by the smallest measure, the tensions of today's world, what more appropriate audience could there be than the members of the General Assembly of the United Nations. The atomic age has moved forward at such a pace that every citizen of the world should have some comprehension, at least in comparative terms, of the extent of this development, of the utmost significance to every one of us. Clearly, if the peoples of the world are to conduct an intelligent search for peace, they must be armed with the significant facts of today's existence. On July 16, 1945, the United States set off the world's first atomic explosion. Since that date in 1945, the United States of America has conducted 42 test explosions. Atomic bombs today are more than 25 times as powerful as the weapons with which the atomic age dawned, while hydrogen weapons are in the ranges of millions of tons of TNT equivalent. Today, the United States stockpile of atomic weapons, which of course increases daily, exceeds by many times the total equivalent of the total of all bombs and all shells that came from every plane and every gun in every theater of war in all of the years of World War II. A single air group, whether afloat or land-based, can now deliver to any reachable target a destructive cargo exceeding in power all the bombs that fell on Britain in all of World War II. But let no one think that the expenditure of vast sums for weapons and systems of defense can guarantee absolute safety for the cities and citizens of any nation. The awful arithmetic of the atomic bomb does not permit of any such easy solution. Even against the most powerful defense, an aggressor in possession of the effective minimum number of, of atomic bombs for a surprise attack could probably place a sufficient number of his bombs on the chosen targets to cause hideous damage. Should such an atomic attack be launched against the United States, our reactions would be swift and resolute. But for me to say that the defense capabilities of the United States are such that they could inflict terrible losses upon an aggressor 
for me to say that the retaliation capabilities of the United States are so great that such an aggressor's land would be laid waste? All this, while fact is not the true expression of the purpose and the hope of the United States. To pause there would be to confirm the hopeless finality of a belief that two atomic colossi are doomed malevolently to eye each other indefinitely across a trembling world. To stop there would be to accept helplessly the probability of civilization destroyed, the annihilation of the irreplaceable heritage of mankind handed down to us generation from generation, and the condemnation of mankind to begin all over again, the age-old struggle upward from savagery toward decency and right and justice. Surely no sane member of the human race could discover victory in such desolation. Could anyone wish his name to be coupled by history with such human degradation and destruction? So my country's purpose is to help us move out of the dark chamber of horrors into the light, to find a way by which the minds of men, the hopes of men, the souls of men everywhere can move forward toward peace and happiness and well-being. We would expect that such an agency would be set up under the aegis of the United Nations. The United States would be more than willing. It would be proud to take up with others principally involved the development of plans whereby such peaceful use of atomic energy would be expedited. Of those principally involved, the Soviet Union must, of course, be one. I would be prepared to submit to the Congress of the United States and with every expectation of approval, any such plan that would, first, encourage worldwide investigation into the most effective peacetime uses of fissionable material, and with the certainty that they had all the material needed for the conduct of all experiments that were appropriate. Second, begin to diminish the potential destructive power of the world's atomic stockpile. Third, allow all peoples of all nations to see that in this enlightened age, the great powers of the earth, both of the East and of the West, are interested in human aspirations. dark background of the atomic bomb, the United States does not wish merely to present strength, but also the desire and the hope for peace. The United States pledges before you and therefore before the world. It's determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. I again thank the delegates for the great honor they have done me in inviting me to appear before them and enlisting me to me so courteously. Thank you.